when analyzing a projectile, the last thing that we'll need to be able to do is to calculate the final velocity of a projectile the instant before it hits the ground. Now we do run into a problem when we try and calculate this, and I'm going to try and highlight for you what that problem is and how we can actually solve it. If we take a look at this example here, we have a cannon that fires a cannonball, becomes a projectile, gravity is the only thing acting on it, follows a parabolic path, and the final velocity, the biggest misconception is that it hits the ground, stops moving, so the final velocity must be zero. That is not correct because the second it hits the ground, it is no longer a projectile, and therefore that final velocity of the projectile doesn't apply. What final velocity of a projectile does pertain to is the final velocity, the split second before it hits the ground. That's the last possible moment that that object was still a projectile, and that's the final velocity. Now what I've done here is I've magnified this ending condition to show you by drawing these velocity vectors that this object is moving both forwards with some kind of x velocity at the end of its motion, as well as down. It's moving down because of gravity, it's moving forward because it was launched out of the cannon, so it's doing both of these things. So let's say we were analyzing one of our problems, and I don't have any numbers, I'm not going to go through an example, but let's say we had our x's and our y's. What we have here is we have all our variables listed in the x, all our variables listed in the y, and if you were asked what is the final velocity of the projectile, hopefully you immediately see there's a problem here. Well, I have a final velocity in the x and a final velocity in the y. So if we have two final velocities, how can I provide a value for the final velocity? It seems like a very vague question for something we have two very specific values for. And this is the problem that we run into. There's a fairly simple way to remedy this problem, and I'm going to go ahead and try and explain to you uh, how that's performed. So the way we actually uh, remedy this problem is actually combining your final x and your final y velocities. If you use a radar gun and you measure the speed of a projectile, such as a baseball or something thrown off a cliff, you'll only get that one value. You, that radar gun will not tell you this is the x final velocity and this is the y final velocity. You only get that one value. So all I've done here is I've taken what we have up here and I've just copied it right here. So if we have a projectile that's moving both forward and downwards at the end of its motion with some kind of final x and final y velocity the moment before it hits the ground, all we have to do is make a right triangle. If we make a right triangle, you'll notice I've taken my x final velocity and my y final velocity. And all I've done is I've just kind of slid this y final velocity over here to make a nice right angle. Once I've done that, that resulting hypotenuse, that's the actual final velocity. That's the value that will be measured by a radar gun. And hopefully you notice if an object is moving forward and down at the same time, well, that projectile is probably moving down in this direction as it, hits, as it strikes the ground. And that's exactly what this hypotenuse gives us. If I took this dotted line and moved it up here, you'll hopefully see that that's the direction this object will likely be traveling in. So to show you an example of this, let's say I apply some values. So we've done our problem and we realize that at the very end this projectile is moving 12 meters per second to the right and it's moving 8 meters per second down. Well, as I said, if, if I combine those two, if I'm not considering X and Y, if I'm just looking at this projectile in real life, hopefully you realize it was launched over here and it's traveling a parabolic arc. When it reaches the bottom it's probably moving towards the ground at some angle as represented by this dotted line and that would be the actual final velocity. So if I make my right triangle, I take my 12, I take my 8 meters per second down, that resulting hypotenuse will be my final velocity. That's what a radar gun will actually pick up. Oh, I have a triangle, which is a right triangle. I know two of the sides. I can therefore use Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared equals c squared. I'll plug in my known values. a and b are 8 and 12 respectively. 8 squared plus 12 squared equals c squared, which in this case is the hypotenuse, that final velocity squared. All I have to do is solve this out, and I should find that my final velocity is about 14.42 meters per second. So despite the fact that this object is moving 12 meters per second to the right at the end, while at the same time moving 8 meters per second down at that final moment, realistically when I combine those two, what I will observe is an object that's moving at 14.42 meters per second in this direction, this combined direction, somewhere in between x and y direction.
Now, some of you may realize there's immediately a problem here because Mr. Walkwich, this is velocity. This is only a magnitude. Velocity requires a magnitude and a direction. You're absolutely correct. The problem here is I can't call this right. I can't call it down. I can't call it x or I can't call it y. It's a combination of the two. It's somewhere in between. Well, if we're analyzing triangles, hopefully you remember not only can I find the sides, but I can also analyze the angles of the triangle as well. And that's what we use when we want to signify direction. If I have a direction that's not along the x or along the y, it's somewhere in between, I just have to use some kind of reference angle to let people know exactly what direction this is traveling in. So if you look at a second example with direction this time, uh, we'll use slightly different values. So this object is moving 10 meters per second to the right, while at the same time moving 4 meters per second down. So I'll set up my triangle, use Pythagorean theorem, and I'll solve, as in the previous problem, that this object would actually be traveling at 10.77 meters per second, somewhere in this direction. But if I want to calculate direction, I need to know what actual angle is it traveling at. So all I've done is I've taken this small right triangle, and I've drawn a little bit larger down here. And I've decided that since this is my reference plane, the x-axis, I want to know what angle off of the x-axis is this 10.77 meters per second acting. Well, if you hopefully remember Pythagorean theorem, then SOGOTOA will also be a term that you've heard before. And if you haven't, that's just the relationship between sine, cosine, and tangent as it relates to a right triangle. So the sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse, where the OH comes from. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, where the AH come from. And tangent is just equal to opposite over adjacent. So once I have my triangle set up, it doesn't matter in this case which trig function we use because I have all three sides. If you only have two, you'll have to select the appropriate. If I only have opposite and hypotenuse, I'll use sine. If I only have the adjacent and hypotenuse, I'll use cosine. And if I only have the opposite and adjacent, I'll use tangent. I have all three, so I've shown you all three calculations. So the sine of this unknown angle is equal to the opposite over the hypotenuse. So if I plug in my values, the sine of this unknown angle equals the opposite side. 4 is the opposite to this angle. 10.77 is the hypotenuse. So sine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Uh, if I want to solve for theta, I have to divide both sides by sine. So divide by sine, divided by sine. Your calculator does not like that. To divide by sine, your calculator likes what's known as the inverse sine. So despite the fact that I will be dividing both sides by sine, I'm left with theta over here, and the inverse sine of 4 over 10.77 will give me 21.8 degrees. So the final answer to this problem would be 10.77 meters per second at 21.8 degrees off of the x-axis. As you decide to choose cosine, same thing, cosine of theta equals adjacent over hypotenuse, the adjacent side being the side that touches the angle that is not the hypotenuse. Same thing, divide both sides by cosine, so theta equals the inverse cosine of 10 over 10.77, and you'll find I will still get 21.8 degrees because that is still the same triangle. Lastly, I could have used tangent opposite over adjacent, tangent of theta equals 4 over 10, when I divide both sides by tangent, I get theta equals the inverse tangent of 4 over 10, and once again, I get 21.8 degrees. Just to recap very quickly, when you have the final, final conditions of your projectile, you'll have it in terms of x and y. First, you can combine those by using Pythagorean theorem, and that will give you the magnitude of your actual final velocity. You'll notice I haven't called it x, haven't called it y, because it's the actual final velocity, the combination of your x and your y velocities find direction, I'm going to use that same right triangle that I've set up, but I'm not going to look at the sides. I'm going to go ahead and look at the angle. I want to know what angle this final velocity is acting at. And I can find that using SOGOTOA and either sine, cosine, or tangent based on which sides I'm actually given.